Well, hello everybody and welcome to Fashion And with me, Scott Schiavone, Fashion Curator. For this week's episode, we'll be delving into the world of Parisian fashion and the origins of haute couture. The very mention of those words conveys a world of unabashed opulence, extravagant luxury and unimaginable wealth. Couture's roots lie in 19th century Paris when one man, an Englishman nonetheless, and his fashion empire laid the foundations of what was to become one of the most famous fashion houses in history. And so the theme of this episode is fashion and worth. Born in 1825 in the Lincolnshire market town of Bourne, Charles Frederick Worth was the youngest of five children. Left impoverished and deserted by his father, at the age of 12, Charles moved to London to become apprentice at the department store of Swan and Edgar in Piccadilly. In 1846, Charles Frederick Worth moved to Paris, armed with not a word of French and only five pound in his pocket. Excusez-moi, vous parlez français? Hear me? No. But by 1852, Worth was working as a sales assistant at Gagelin OPG AC, a prestigious Parisian court dressmaker. Eventually, Gagelin granted Worth permission to open a dressmaking department, his first official entrance into the dressmaking world. In 1858, Worth opened his eponymous business at number 7 Rue de la Paix with his business partner Otto Gustave Boberg specialising in ready-made fashions and the sale of silks, lace, cashmere and furs and the making of ladies' dresses and mantles. Now, the topic of worth and its associated literature is vast and so with this in mind, we will be looking at the House of Worth through four different themes. Worth signatures, the birth of haute couture, worth empire and fashionable society and family and legacy. There are in museum collections across the world a number of examples that survive from the House of Worth. When studying these various examples, it becomes apparent that there are certain signatures that indicate a garment is from the House of Worth. One of those signatures is quite literal, and that is the designer label. Granted, very few confirmed examples survive from the early days of the house, and some that do are only attributed to Worth. It was not until the 1860s that dressmakers started to sew labels into the waistbands of bodices, printed with their names as identifiers of their work. Charles Frederick Worth was one of the first to sign his clothes with a designer label, establishing the concept of the dressmaker as artist. The earliest known label to display the name Worth and Bulbark is a dress held by the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia. Although there are questions regarding its authenticity, it is believed to be an early example predating the house's associations with the French Imperial Court, the arms of which would normally appear on their labels. Another early example is held at the Museum of the City of New York. Now this example does include the French imperial arms, indicating Worth's status as an imperial warrant holder to the Empress from around 1864. As an arbiter of taste, the Worth label became a stamp of superior quality. Another of Worth's signatures was the crinoline, which became an emblem of the Second French Empire. The crinoline suited the early designs of Charles Frederick Worth, especially his over-the-top use of silk and tulle. However, it was this style that he pioneered that also caused him much disdain. He tried on various occasions to free women of the crinoline, but its allure was too strong and women were just not ready to give up their wide skirts. Knowing that the crinoline was here to stay for the foreseeable future, Worth gave the crinoline a graceful makeover. In the 1860s, when the shape of the crinoline changed, becoming more elliptical than round, Worth made the silhouette slimmer by cutting the fabric of the skirts in triangles or gourd panels instead of gathering it in at the waist. His son and successor Jean-Philippe Worth stated, Around 1866 or 1867, my father came to the conclusion that the crinoline was becoming absurd. 
the enormous amount of material gathered across the front deformed the figure. He decided to remove the quantity of material bunched at the waist. To do this, he invented the gourd skirt, so cut that it fitted the figure snugly at the waist and yet at the hem was as wide as a giant lampshade. The princess line was another style pioneered by Worth. In 1866, for Alexandra, Princess of Wales, Worth designed his princess line dress, in which the horizontal waist seam between the bodice and the skirt was eliminated in favour of vertical seams that skimmed the contours of the body. Jean-Philippe continued to feature the princess line in his designs and the style became extremely popular. The princess line suited the elegant silhouette of the fishtail bustle of the 1870s and shelf-like bustle of the 1880s, becoming a staple of the Worth portfolio. However, it was in bespoke textile design that the House of Worth created one of its most defining signatures. Charles Frederick Worth made it one of his principal missions to encourage and support the various industries related to the dressmaking trades in France. The most important were the textile mills of Lyon, where the House of Worth sought to bring renewed and continued prosperity to its fine textile factories. The most famous of these was Tassinari and Châtel. Throughout their company's history, no other couture house has supplied them with so much work as the House of Worth. The majority of garments, especially those designed at the turn of the century, were more recognisable by their singular bespoke fabrics than their fashionable silhouettes. Certain motifs became house signatures, such as stripes, feathers, wheat, stars, butterflies, carnations, irises, tulips, chestnuts and oak leaves, scallops and scales, and boars of roses. Bespoke textile design was what separated the House of Worth from other dressmakers of the time. Another major element in the vocabulary of Worth was historicism. Both Jean-Philippe and his father drew inspiration for their designs from coats of arms, historic and folk costume, and images of fashions from centuries past. They used these references as a rich resource bank to create a bedazzling array of spectacular ball gowns and fancy dress costumes, especially during the 1880s and 1890s. Charles Frederick Worth is universally credited as the father of haute couture. His premises on the Rue de la Paix became a microcosm of luxury, a couture house dedicated to an international elite, a place to see and be seen. Because mid to late 19th century etiquette dictated that a lady never wear the same dress twice, Worth was faced with the task of creating new designs for a plethora of clients season after season. Worth became highly skilled at churning out design after design, all based on variations of a particular theme. This process naturally evolved into designing whole collections, forming the very basis of today's fashion industry. Worth is attributed with establishing the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture. Founded in 1868, Worth and his son set up the organisation as an attempt to safeguard high fashion and stop couture designs from being copied. Designers who were admitted were required to earn the right to label themselves a couture house according to certain specifications, the exact parameters not officially defined until 1945. In the mid to late 19th century, the newly moneyed upper middle class, the aristocracy and courts of Europe flaunted their immense wealth through fashionable dress. Paris took centre stage and the fashionable lifestyle took its cue from the salons and grand balls organised by the newly established court of Napoleon III. Opulence and excess reigned supreme in an age of luxury and conspicuous consumption. Contemporary writer Auguste de Bay commented, Jewellery dress, flowers and all the immense variety of ornaments that make up a dazzling toilette have arrived at a state of perfection which characterises periods of luxury. Diamonds, pearls, gold, silver, polished steel, crystal, feathers, silk, etc. have been transformed into delicious articles of the toilette. 
Charles Frederick Worth set his sights on the glitterati and women of the imperial court. His wife, Marie Worth, suggested approaching the wife of the new Austrian ambassador to France, Pauline von Metternich. Pauline had become a close friend and confidant of the Empress Eugenie and was known to have had influence on her. As the legend goes, one morning her maid brought in an album of sketches and said, There is a young lady who requests that your highness deigns to cast an eye over the sketches in this book. They are sketches of outfits done by her husband. He very much desires to make a gown for you at any price, just as long as he is able to make one for you. This gentleman is English. His name is Worth. Pauline's initial reaction was one of outrage. How dare an Englishman think he be good enough to supply toilettes to ladies of the French court? Curiosity got the better of her, however, and she took a peek. She was mesmerised. She responded to her maid, Bring me this Englishwoman! To which the maid replied, But madame, the lady is not English, but purebred French. The princess met Marie Worth and was asked to name a price for a gown. Pauline ordered two, at a total cost of 600 francs. One of the gowns was worn by Pauline at her next appearance at court. The gown was made of white tulle, spangled with silver and scattered with daisies with pink centres and sprays of wild grasses, also veiled in white tulle. The Empress was captivated and inquired who had made this marvel of simplicity and elegance. The very next day, at 10am, Charles Frederick Worth was summoned to see the Empress. His career and the House of Worth was officially launched. And that was the last time anyone got a Worth throat for 300 francs. On average, a client's annual expenditure at the House of Worth ranged from 10,000 to 100,000 francs. Worth's famous clientele formed the cornerstone of his success and secured his place as dresser to the imperial court and the ladies from the upper echelons of society. The portraits of German artist Franz Xaver Winterhalter depicted a veritable who's who of royalty and aristocracy during the 19th century. There was certainly more than a hint of association between the clients of both men. The French court, whom Worth dressed, was the meeting ground for Winterhalter's sitters. Coincidence? I think not. The vast majority of female sitters in the work of Winterhalter are painted wearing magnificent confections of silk and frothy tulle, more than likely designed by Charles Frederick Worth. Describing one of his creations, Worth said, on one occasion I made a dress that took 100 metres of silk. It was glazed taffeta in three shades of purple, from deep lilac to pale violet. The skirt was covered all over in deep ruches. Winterhalter's portraits reiterate just how much worth was sought after across Europe by ladies who frequented its various courts. These portraits, since very little gowns from the house's early days still survive, give us a unique glimpse into Worth's creative output during this time. The luxury and elegance of Worth's creations cannot be overemphasised and Winterhalter's portraits are integral to the study of the historic fashion powerhouse. His fashions were worn at the royal courts of Holland, Spain and Great Britain and the imperial courts of France, Russia and Austria. Coinciding with the fall of the Second French Empire in 1870, the partnership between Worth and Boberg dissolved, leaving Charles Frederick Worth and his sons to take sole ownership. The House of Worth thrived during the Third Republic, due in part to its reputation and elite list of fashionable society clientele, situated in other courts and countries across the world. Worth's wealthy foreign clients, such as the American Hewitt sisters Eleanor and Sarah, would collectively place orders of around 100,000 francs in a single trip. The American Code of Manners, published in 1884, stated, Worth says that the American women are the best customers he has, far better than Queen's. They ask for the price. American women never do. They simply say, give me the best, the most beautiful, the most fashionable gown. Other clients included Isabella Stuart Gardner, Maria Fyodorovna, Empress of Russia, and Lady Mary Curzon, Viceroyne of India. (music) 
Over the course of a century, the House of Worth was run by a duo of creative partnerships. Initially by Charles Frederick Worth and his business partner Otto Gustav Boberg, and then subsequently by three generations of Worths. After the death of Charles Frederick Worth in 1895, his son Jean-Philippe took over as the creative force behind the house. Jean-Philippe's style was like his father's, extravagant and glamorous. However, it was infused with a sense of modernity that balanced the strict codes of decorum and the new aspirations of the modern woman. Jean-Philippe was the master of fin de siècle haute couture and defined a period of elegance and style that disappeared with the advent of World War I. In 1928, published two years after his death, Jean-Philippe Worth's book, Worth, A Century of Fashion, an original copy of which I am extremely privileged to have, was a memoir of reminiscences surrounding the history of the House of Worth and its exclusive clientele. Amazing. After Jean-Philippe's death, the house was continued by Jacques and Jean-Charles Worth and then Maurice and Roger Worth. By the end of the 1950s, the House of Worth vanished due to increased competition, failure to appoint an artistic director capable of breathing new life into its fashions and the lack of a fifth generation to take over the family firm. The House of Worth lay dormant until Italian designer Giovanni Bedin who had previously worked for Karl Lagerfeld and Thierry Mugler, was appointed creative director. Presenting the first new couture collection for spring-summer 2010, the renewed couture effort was unsuccessful and the last collection was presented for autumn-winter 2013. The lasting legacy of Charles Frederick Worth and his eponymous fashion house is of course the foundations he laid for what was to become the exclusive and luxurious world of haute couture. From the mid-19th century, the House of Worth stands out from the rest as defining the epitome of Parisian luxury fashion. During the height of its powerful reign, the House of Worth defined opulence and extravagance and was patronised by royalty, aristocracy and high society. After a century of excellence and a failed attempt to revive the brand in the early 2010s, the House of Worth will now forever be remembered as a fashion powerhouse symptomatic of a bygone age that exists now only within the confines of history or the coveted Fashion Museum exhibition. Well that's it for today's episode, I hope you enjoyed looking at the father of haute couture, Charles Frederick Worth and the House of Worth. If you've missed any previous episodes of Fashion and, they are available to watch now. Past episodes include Fashion and Art, Fashion and the Body and Fashion in the 1980s. Please remember to comment, like and share and please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a thing from Fashion and with me, Scott Schiavone, Fashion Curator.